You're listening to the Author Inside You podcast, a weekly podcast designed to motivate you to finish writing a book, choose a publisher, and have your work build an audience. Keep listening if you're looking to get propelled into the next chapter of your life. And now, it's the Author Inside You podcast with your host, Leah and Matt Rafferty. Hello, and welcome to the Author Inside You podcast. I'm Matt Rafferty. And I'm Leah Rafferty. Joining us today is Linda Plunkett, author of Supernatural Rescue. Linda earned her PhD in Christian psychology, founded a nonprofit, recovered from brain surgery, and has raised two sons. Linda and her husband, Jim, live in Florida. Welcome, Linda. Thanks for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. Well, Linda, would you mind telling us about your illness and how it led you to write a book? Oh, of course not. I'd be happy to. Basically, um, in the end of 2012, I discovered I had a major brain tumor in my frontal lobe of my brain, which required an eight, almost eight-hour brain surgery. Wow. wow. Yes. And so this was very devastating. I really had not been sick. Um, no high blood pressure. No, really no major health problems that would lead me to believe that I was really ill and, until this diagnosis. Wow. So it very much came as a shock, but uh, the surgery was supposed to be three to four hours. It ended up being almost an eight-hour surgery and left me feeling somewhat like a vegetable, really not being able to walk, really form my thoughts or to speak. It was a very difficult time. Wow. And your family, so you're going into surgery and you're, everyone's thinking three to four hours and everything's going to be okay maybe, and then you come out and things are not what everyone planned. And plus the eight hours exactly. must have scared your and family exactly. quite a bit. Exactly. And there were, there were complications in the surgery, which no one expected. So just me surviving that surgery was probably a miracle. Well, congratulations mm -hmm. in, on the miracle. Thank you so much. Well, then what was it like uh, getting your speech back and your motor skills? Well, it was extremely difficult. Um, funny enough, after the surgery, the brain surgeon said to my husband, you have to take her walking. Well, that was somewhat ironic mm -hmm. to ask that because I couldn't make steps. I had no balance. My balance was completely gone. So my husband, the dear soul that he was, he literally drug me around on his shoulder to force me to stand on my feet and walk. But wow. apparently after a brain surgery, even though I had these difficulties with my motor skills, it was extremely necessary for me to walk to recover from the brain surgery. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. People say, what does it mean? I mean, how do you feel? How did you feel? What was it like to be a vegetable? And, you know, maybe that's an exaggeration, but I don't think so because I I had trouble talking. They had put me on a drug, and after the surgery, I for a very brief point of time I, while I was on this drug, I could talk very, very quickly and, and just go on and on and on, like, oh, I know where my house is. I want to go home. Sure. If you don't let me go, I'm going to leave. You know, silly mm -hmm. things like that. And then when I got home, I had trouble forming the thoughts, and I couldn't speak, and I couldn't think well. And the first 30 days, literally, I put my face in my hands and cried. And it was it was a depression, but a different kind of depression. I just didn't know how to get better, and it was very frustrating. I can't even imagine. I, yeah, a, a nightmare, I would think. It was, because you have to remember, I'd been a practicing um, Christian psychologist for a number of years, had my own practice. So when this happened, everything shut down. Everything that I loved doing and helping other people, I was unable to do at that point. Did writing the book help you come to terms with your illness? Yes, it did. In fact, um, I had a home health care person come to the house because I really wasn't able to go anywhere, do anything. So this individual came to my home, and when I cried and said, I don't know how to do this, he said, start a journal, write things down each day. Well, in the beginning, I could not even read my own writing. I mean, my handwriting mm -hmm. was that poor. But eventually, I did attempt to take notes and write things down. And that really formed the basis of the book down the road. I'm so happy I did that because he said, it'll help you. It'll help you follow the journey of your illness. But also when you get better, you'll see your progress. And mm. that was extremely helpful in forming the basis for the book, especially the, the early, very early days and weeks after my surgery. So is the book about your journey of recovery? Well, it was a memoir. Yes, it was about that segment in my life. Um, 
it was a book I never intended to write. I thought as a psychologist, I would love to write a book one day, and I still hope to write that book, which would help people with their issues, things like improving your self-esteem and having a closer relationship with God and communicating better you know, with your spouse and with your family, things like on, on those topics. But I really never dreamed I would write this kind of book because I never dreamed that I would go through this type of situation, having always been healthy. Well, I would think that this book would help other people who unfortunately have gone through uh, devastating illnesses and maybe help them say, oh, you are not alone. Exactly. And, I, you know, I think as I look back, I was one of those people I really struggled along the way. I had pain for a long time after the surgery, developed fibromyalgia. And mm -hmm. even at one point cried out to God, you know, why and why didn't you let me die? I mean, I really mm -hmm. felt that mm -hmm. bad physically at one point. But now as I look back, this book was not so much for me. It was to help other people. When I was going through this, it was a very lonely, dark, dark time of my life. There was no one. I, I really had no one to talk to about a, having a brain surgery, you know, coming out of a surgery or going through all the thoughts and feelings that I went through. I had no one really to discuss my thoughts and feelings with. And so it was very, very lonely, very dark. And I feel because of what I've written, there will be people out there that will read the book and say, wow, I'm not alone. I'm not the only one who's gone through this. And I really feel perhaps the reason I went through it all was to help other people. Mm -hmm. Well, that's pretty cool that you see that and you could feel that because I'm sure that will touch, your book will touch people who do feel isolated and not only them who are going through it, but their family members. Yes, I think so. And um, I enjoy getting feedback from people who have read the book, some people who've heard me speak. And I, I really do think certain things like, you know, being upset, even being angry at God, you know, feeling alone, feeling like I don't know how to get well, I want to get well, but I don't know how to do it. Those types of thoughts and feelings, I would not have known that had I not gone through this. Sure. I would not have recognized those feelings had I not gone through this experience. Well, Linda, what was the writing process like? How far into your recovery until you started writing the book? And then like, how long did it take to do it? I would say I started the following year. I had my the beginning notes, and um, I just felt this little, I don't know, this little, I mean, Christianity, we might call it the Holy Spirit, but this urge to, to move forward, and yet I didn't know how to write a book. I didn't have any idea. I had my notes. Um, so I had run into um, some writers at a bookstore and, you know, they were, they were signing their books. And I said, well, how did you write your book? <laughs> and they said, we went to a writer's conference. And so I went online and I Googled writer's conferences and a couple of them popped up. And really that's how I learned many of the, the things that I needed to know to do a book. In fact, I even met my publisher at that conference who was an extreme help um, in getting my book published, in helping me with the title, in promoting it. And you know, I wouldn't say don't do a book if you don't have a publisher. There's so many good books out there that have been self-published. But in my case, just recovering from a brain surgery, I really did need a lot of help. And my publisher was one who really, really helped me along this way and along this journey. Well, that's really interesting. Can you tell us more about going to writers' conferences we really haven't spoken much about that on our podcast, and it seems like it's a great way to, you know, get started. So what did you find there, and, and what should people look for? Well, like I said, I basically just went online and Googled. Um, in my case, I felt my book was going to be a faith-based book, so I did Google Christian Writers Conferences, and most of them had already taken place. This was the middle of 2013, but there was one left, and it was in Michigan, and so I booked my trip to Michigan hopped on the plane and went there really not knowing a lot. You know, I had a PhD in psychology, but that's just, that doesn't mean you know how to write a book. Right, right, <laughs> you know, yeah. you, you have, you have expertise in one area, but you know, book writing is completely different. So it helps me in analyzing options and understanding how difficult it is to get a publisher. I had no idea the odds are something like one in 30, one in 50. It's, you know, it's very low chance that you will get a publisher. <sighs> However, in my case, it did, it did work out for me. Wow. But, but um, yeah, they give you the pros and cons of self-publishing, getting a publisher. Um, 
the things, you know, a lot of things you don't really realize editing. Editing is very important. Proofreading is important. Mm -hmm. I actually had my book edited twice. And the first editor said basically, oh, you need to cut back. You need to condense. You need to make it more more pointed. Um, the chapters, the more condensed, you know, shorter. And then when I went to the um, – when I got my publisher, my publisher's editor said, oh, you need to expand. Oh. <laughs> and so I'm thinking, wow, some of the stuff I took out, maybe I need to put it back yeah. in. But, you know, there are opinions, different opinions. But um, I think I got very good advice because people have told me they've actually read the book in one sitting that, you know, that it was interesting to them, mm-hmm. that they just went from chapter to chapter. And so I think by keeping the chapters maybe a little more condensed, Um, it was good and it made it easier for people to read than maybe adding too many details. But there again, I think that's just an opinion. What about finding the publisher? How did you go about, was that, that's a result of going to? It was. And there again, I did not, you know, you, you, you meet a few publishers and, but you don't, you know, you have low expectations because they've already told you, oh, it's hard. It's (laughs) almost impossible to get a publisher. You don't expect it. So, um, but a publisher, um, I did talk to a publisher, basically, he said, well, you know, why don't you just send us, you know, send us a few chapters, you know, send us a proposal. Honestly, I only had at that point a few chapters. (laughs) I would be lying if I said I had written the book because I really hadn't. So, you know, I thought, well, I could throw together a couple chapters, I guess. So, um, you know, and surprise of surprises, they, they wanted me to continue with them. And their publishing deal was a little different. There's different types of publishing deals. Sometimes they take your book and they do it. In other cases, you might self-publish. You might do it yourself. This was kind of a combined effort where I spent a certain amount of money and they spent a certain amount of money and they used their resources and I used mine. We put it all together. And so for me, that worked really well. But they did really give me a lot of help. I'm not sure I would have had the finished product that, that I have now had it not been for them. Well, it's all interesting because it was kind of like a chance meeting at with the authors at the bookstore. Then you go to, to fly to Michigan. You're from Florida. So that was, you know, some big deal to go, you know, it wasn't right well, around the corner. Know, and I have a word for that. And, and this is just my term. But instead of a coincidence, I call it a God incident. Okay. I really believe that this was God's will. And that this book was supposed to be published. And like I said, maybe I went through everything I went through so that other people could be helped. Sure. You know, that's what I like to think. I don't believe a lot of things. I mean, some things may happen by chance. But in this situation, I feel a lot of things just fit together and just, you know, continued, continued the process until the book finally came out. Well, sure, because you said that you even met the publisher at this conference, right? Right. So everything right. just fit perfectly. It did. It did. And I feel very blessed. And um, like I say, it really, um, I think we worked very well together. And, and it is there again, important if you have a publisher, I mean, whoever you're working with, you want it to be a good working experience. You want it sure. to be comfortable and you want to feel like-minded in, in your, you know, the things you, you agree on and, and the goals of writing the book. I've got to ask, so you only had a couple chapters written, and then you came to an agreement. Were you, like, under the gun then? Did they say they wanted to oh, see yeah. the rest in, in six weeks? Or? Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> yes. I was definitely under the gun, and not only because I wanted this book to be more than just what I went through and what I learned and how I recovered. Most of my recoveries in this book, I will say there's probably another book coming because a lot more has happened since then, but... um Basically, I wanted to write chapters that would help other people deal with different topics that I had to deal with during this time, you know, difficult topics like maybe, you know, sorrow and suffering. And, you know, in my case, you know, I had some anger issues with God, being real with God and and even forgiving people that I felt that had let me down, that things had not worked out the way that I had hoped. And so but these are common issues that sometimes people have to deal with in other situations as well. So mm-hmm. I wanted to have additional chapters at the end that dealt with those types of topics. And that's your psychologist and you. <laughs> that's the psychologist and me. And right, there's a whole other book out there waiting to be written about things that I've gone through and things that I have learned that could help other people. So I'm excited about that. Sure. What about the book coverage? How did that Well, work? this is something the publisher helped me with, not only the title, but the cover, which was a big help. And um, probably I would have had a different title, but 
they they explained to me that you know sometimes titles are overused and the, the title that I was thinking of too many other books have the same title and so mm. they were very instrumental in helping me with the title and also the cover of the book which turned out to be very beautiful yes it mm-hmm. is very pretty and, and the title of the book is very nice exactly and it's uh, it's something that I can interest people and there again I'm a, I'm of the Christian faith and so I have you know my uh, different thoughts about supernatural experiences in God, but I'm surprised how many people out there that aren't necessarily the Christian faith, but they really believe in the supernatural realm. And so it's kind of a door opener. Oh, okay. Great. And so that was the the publisher's idea, the supernatural rescue. Yes. Supernatural rescue was um, the publisher's idea. And then did the publisher supply an editor because you said you had two editors. I did. I did. I, I, after going to the conference, see, I felt the importance of, of having it proofread and edited myself. But they, as a part of their publishing package, they do provide someone who also edits it. So that's what I mean. When mine, it's so interesting about editing, though. People, I kind of laugh about it in proofreading. I had it proofread twice, edited twice, and someone said, "Oh, I found three mistakes in your book." <laughs> you know, and I had to laugh. So nothing's perfect, you know. Right. Right. But. Um, I was very grateful for all the help. As I said before, I I had written a doctoral dissertation and done a number, you know, of doctoral papers. However, writing a book is a completely different thing. Sure. I've heard that even huge authors have mistakes in their books because, you know, just your eye doesn't catch it. And then in the first edition of books that you'll often find typos. Well, we do the best we can, but in truth, we we aren't perfect, are we? (laughs) Right. So, Linda, do you have advice for other authors who are working on a book? Well, I I would just say to them, um, if you need help, you know, go forward and look for that help. It might be going to a writer's conference. It might be talking to other people that have published books. But in my case, I did need the encouragement. You know, I'm unfortunately, I'm not always good at following through until the end. But if you get yourself a publisher, you get someone to encourage you. It's much more likely, I think, that you will finish your book. Mm-hmm. So um, I would say, you know, don't get discouraged if, you know, if you, you, you reach some some type of, I don't know, a barrier or some type of a wall and you just feel you can't keep going. I would say go out there and talk to some people or attend a conference and see what other people are doing. And that could certainly serve as some encouragement to keep going. Great. And then what about marketing? Is your publisher helping you with marketing the book? You know, marketing is one of those tricky things. Um, I mean, they helped me get my book at Barnes and Noble and Amazon, but right. it's not it's not that easy. I'd say that's probably one of the hardest things about maybe getting your book out there is, you know, getting people to read it. In my case, I enjoy public speaking, so I try to get radio interviews. I've done a number of slots as a speaker for different organizations oh, that will sell your book. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes just, you know, just people passing it on. Um, I have given them as gifts to people and people will take it and pass it to another person and that person will pass it on. And and so, um, you know, but I, I do, I, in my case, I felt like if one person read my book and got help from that book, it would be worth it. Sure. Because of what I went through, it was such a difficult time, but if it could help one person, then it would make that all worthwhile. So for me, maybe, it's not so much the number of books that I sell, it's the number of people that I can reach. And that you know would not only include talking um, on the radio, TV, or um, at you know different types of events. I have a ladies event coming up the end of March. I'm gonna be speaking for 100, 150 women. Oh, great. So those type of events, because what I, I notice is some people read and some people don't read. You know, some mm-hmm. people I offer the book to, well, I don't read. But those type of people, that type of pe- person, rather, would um, possibly go and hear me at a, you know, a speaker's event or at a meeting. Sure. Um, so as long as they get the, me- as long as the message comes through, whether it be through them reading the book or me sharing it verbally with them. I think that's the most important thing, that the message reaches the person it's intended to reach. And so, yeah, the marketing part of it, I'm probably not the best person <laughs> to, um, you know, to ask that question. Sure. But, but you know, I'm still, I've, I hired a publicist. I have a wonderful publicist. He's helping me get radio interviews. And so. Sure. Um, that's our friend Bruce. Exactly. Exactly. My father published a book a number of years ago. And I remember how many, how many 
years it took and but we eventually distributed all our copies and so i have a number of my own copies and um you know i'm i'm just believing one day all those copies will be handed (laughs) out and uh, hopefully the next two books that i'm about to write the same thing will happen great and what about social media are you using social media to promote supernatural rescue well, I'm glad that you encouraged me to do this for your interview because I put a message on there and got a lot of a, a lot of interest. It's something I haven't done, but I intend to do more in the future because I think it is a really good idea. And I probably have 500 people on Facebook, so why not? Oh, wow. You know, you have a lot of followers, yeah. Well, and I'm a ballroom dancer, and I compete in ballroom dancing. Oh, so part okay. Of, part of that is the people you know that I that I compete with, but. Um, yeah, I'm, I, it never ceases to amaze me. I'll, put, I'll post something, and I think, oh, everybody I know has a book, and then a couple more people will say, I want your book. <laughs> That's great. So I do think, although I haven't utilized it as much as I probably should, it's an excellent way from what I'm finding out. And wait till number two and number three come out, right? Yes, exactly. So you had a brain tumor. You had to re learn a lot of things, and not only did you get your PhD, but now you also are a ballroom dancer? Well, and and even this ballroom dancing, I've been able to use the testimony, which this is very unusual. And there again, I believe this is just another God thing, but um, I, I got a new ballroom teacher. This was about a year ago. And he said, I really would like to do a dance that tells your story about what you've been through. And so lo and behold, this was probably six months later, I find myself in a professional recording studio um, in Orlando with backup dancers and oh, wow. I, I performed oh this dance at this big competition called the Millennium Dance Competition and they gave me a Dance Hero Award and I was so humbled because I had no idea I was going to receive that but they said I overcame adversity and I encouraged other people and they gave me this award oh, this huge trophy nice. so I was just thrilled but it was such a surprise and like I tell people I mean I appreciate the award but I really feel it's not about me it's about god and what god has done in my life and i'm so grateful that's pretty neat that is very nice well linda do you have a a good way that people can get in touch with you if they want to reach out and and connect with you Uh, my email address is hope for hurting and i'll spell that h-o-p-e-f-o-r-h-u-r-t-i-n-g at aol.com okay and matt will put that in the show notes well linda it was great talking to you and hearing your story and congratulations on the first of many books. Well, thank you so much, and I enjoyed speaking with you, Matt and Leah. Well, as you heard, Linda said that she put something out on Facebook about her upcoming interview on the Author Inside You podcast, and it was a big hit. And if you know a friend who would particularly like this interview with Linda, please share this episode with them. We appreciate that. And until next time, ride on. Thank you for listening to the Author Inside You podcast with your host, Leah and Matt Rafferty.